we're going to continue talking about electrons today. Last time we introduced light and waves to discuss electron behavior because electrons have properties similar to light and wave. And we talked about relationships between wavelength and frequency, energy and frequency. Today we're going to talk about how the positioning of the electron was determined as well as quantum numbers and then next time we'll get into the crux of the chapter which is on electron configuration. It'll probably be something very new to you. It's not difficult but like everything else in chemistry it requires some practice. So what we're going to start with today is something that you saw quite a bit of in the Pogel packet that I told you should have been done for today. That was on electrons and light. And what you saw in those packets was line emission spectrum. You saw it for hydrogen, you saw it for boron. So we're going to be going through some of that concepts here, but having seen it and worked through some of it, I think will really help you. So in regard to atomic emission spectrum, when atoms of an element in the gaseous phase, are excited by an input of energy, they emit light. And that's because electrons get excited to a higher energy level, they absorb energy, what goes up must come back down, and when they come down to a lower energy level, they release or emit energy in the form of light. And if they come back to that second energy level, you can see that light because it's in the visible spectrum. Now we're going to look at atomic emission spectrum ourselves with spectroscopes and the tubes next time, um, or, or Wednesday. I just wanted to set it up for all the classes. It's really kind of cool. So the emitted light can be broken down into a line emission spectrum. which consists of discrete lines of specific frequencies or colors. And you saw this in the Pogel packet that you worked on and you saw those line emission spectrum, for example, for hydrogen, a red line, a blue-green, a blue-violet, a violet, boron, each element has a unique line emission spectrum. So you actually can identify an element from its line emission spectrum, but it is a tricky thing to do. So each element has a unique line emission spectrum. It's known as the element's atomic emission spectrum, and we can look at a few of them shown here. For example, here's hydrogen's line emission spectrum. You can have a gas discharge tube. For example, this one contains hydrogen. It would have a lavender glow. And then these slits in a prism are found in an instrument known as a spectroscope. And what you'll see is this line emission spectrum. And again, red light has a higher wavelength than violet light. This has a higher wavelength and therefore a smaller frequency and energy. Different elements have different line emission spectrum. This is the simplest hydrogen. Hydrogen has one electron only. Other emission spectra, for example, neon has this line emission spectrum. We're going to look at mercury as well next time. You can see its line emission spectrum. Helium, each element has a unique line emission spectrum. That visible light is seen when the electron goes from a higher level to the second level. That's when you can see visible light.
the one we always start with would be hydrogen atoms because hydrogen atoms, a hydrogen atom has one electron only. So excited hydrogen atoms emit a lavender glow and when put through that narrow slit and prism, a line emission spectrum is observed. There's a lot of information that you can learn about the basic structure of an atom. For example, here's hydrogen. So the electron can go to four different high energy levels and come back to the second. Here's helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. So they get more complex as you have more and more electrons, but it wouldn't be an easy thing to do to match this to its element every time. That's a little bit tricky. So we don't use that tool very much to identify elements. The emission spectrum of an atom indicates that the energy it emits is quantized. And that means that only certain quantities of energy can be emitted and you can calculate that energy as we talked about the other day. Before we fill in the blanks here, I have a quick little video that I think will help you visualize Bohr's model of the atom in regard to electron location. He's going to work with the hydrogen atom. Let's take a look at this concept. The famous scientist Al Bohr developed the model of the atom as opposed definite orbit in which electrons can travel around the nucleus without radiating energy. Or suppose seven different bubbles or distances that occur around the nucleus. So here's your nucleus with protons and what? Neutrons. Neutrons. And he's saying that electrons are in rings or orbits around the nucleus. This ring is of lower energy because it's closer to the nucleus, so the energy the electron would have would be lower here than it would here. When an electron goes from a ring closer to the nucleus, farther away from the nucleus, it absorbs energy. When an electron goes from a ring farther from the nucleus, closer to the nucleus, it releases energy in the form of light. If that electron goes from high to the second energy level, it emits energy in the form of visible light that you can see. Those are the colored lines in the line emission spectra. It can go back to N is one and N is three, but those are not in the visible light region. They're outside the visible light region. I want you to watch these electrons closely and you'll see what happens when they move closer to the nucleus. The greater the radius of the bubble, the greater the energy of the electron at that level. That's the sign of an electron's orbit became known as energy bubble. And of course, suppose the only way an electron can lose energy is by dropping to a lower energy level. This happens to have a photon of radiation that bends light. Longer the electron remains in the given orbit, their energy level remains constant. This model suggests that in an atom's normal state, all the electrons are in the lowest energy levels available. Because all the electrons are in their lowest energy levels respectively, they cannot move to a lower level, and therefore cannot lose energy. The atom is therefore stable and is said to be in its ground level state. The energy is added to an atom by heat, electrical energy, Absorbed energy can cause one or more of the electrons within the atom to move to a higher energy level. This happens the atoms are said to be in an excited state. In the excited state, the atom is unstable and makes efforts to return to its ground state. As the electrons return to lower energy levels, they release energy. The energy given off from the atom is vastly cheaper than the amount absorbed. 
That's fine. Right. You can find it. I think you love it. Since the 1940s, when a revolution occurred in the town of Chiswick, Ford's model has been modified slightly. So this was the first model proposed. It's one you've probably seen before. It's the way people always draw atoms. Yet there are a lot of limitations with Bohr's model, and it's not the one accepted today. So what Bohr said, 1913, he was a graduate student of Ernest Rutherford, who discovered the location of the protons in the nucleus with the gold foil experiment we talked about previously. He said, when the electron is closest to the nucleus, it has the lowest possible energy. Energy is abbreviated with an E. The electron can only orbit in certain energy levels or orbits, sometimes called rings. Later on, you'll see shells. When an electron is excited by an outside energy source, it absorbs energy and jumps to higher energy levels. When it falls back to a lower energy level, the electron releases or emits an amount of energy, a quantum, equal to the difference in energy between the two orbits. So the ground state is the lowest possible energy level for electrons. The excited state is an unstable state. Very high energy, doesn't last long. It's like some of those girlfriend-boyfriend relationships, they're over in 20 minutes, too much work. High energy, unstable. You can use this formula to calculate the energy of an electron. This is Bohr's constant divided by n squared, where n is either 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. And that 1 through 7 corresponds to these rings that you saw in the video clip. The higher the n, the farther from the nucleus. You will also see when we talk about the periodic table in more detail, that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven rows on the periodic table. And there's a link between that n and that number that we'll explore later on. So you can calculate the energy of an electron. I'm not gonna ask you to do that, but it can be done. So you can calculate the energy of an electron and that has a lot to do with its location, its position, which orbit it is in. So n is a number 1 through 7. And you're going to see that this is a quantum number because it can only have definitive values. Now this model shown here for electron location is very limiting. It applies to hydrogen only. And hydrogen is the only element on the periodic table with a single electron. So it works for hydrogen, but when you get into multi-electron species, which is everything else, it's not going to work. Nonetheless, you can see Bohr's model here, protons and neutrons in the nucleus. When an electron goes from a lower level, n equals 2, to a higher level, the electron absorbs energy and it jumps to a higher orbit. And you can calculate that energy by multiplying Planck's constant, H, times the frequency. Now in your notes, I just took this from somewhere, and they had the frequency as F. We, um, we abbreviate frequency with a V. So don't get confused there. Oopsie. Um, 
It's just the way this particular book did it. And I looked at your newest book coming out shortly, and it does it the same way. But it doesn't really matter. If, on the other hand, the electron goes from a high to a lower energy level, it will release energy. If it hits the second level as it goes down, if it finishes at the second level, that's the visible light you see. And again, you already know how to calculate that energy, Planck's constant times frequency. So this is Bohr's model. Electrons are in orbits. When they move away from the nucleus, they absorb energy. When they move toward the nucleus, they release or emit energy. So in regard to our models of the atom, we've talked about this and you were tested on this last week. And most of you tested very successfully on Chapter 2. And that's why when I test on Chapter 3, I put a few questions from Chapter 2 because it's so easy and I think it will help you because Chapter 3 is a lot harder than 2. Dalton talked about the indivisible and indestructible spherical atom. J.J. Thompson, cathode ray tube, discovery of the electron and the proton. Lord Kelvin, also known as William Thompson, talked about the plum pudding model with the sea of positive charge as the pudding and the raisins as the negative electrons. Rutherford discovered the dense nuclear core where protons are located, electrons outside using a gold foil experiment. Bohr, who we just mentioned, said electrons revolve around the nucleus, similar to planets revolving in orbits around the sun. Bohr's model helps to explain why negatively charged electrons aren't pulled toward the positively charged nucleus. Bohr says that electrons are in orbits, that energy is quantized, so electrons are in energy states, and the neutrons would shield some of the positive charge from the protons in the nucleus. Modern day model for the atom is the quantum mechanical model, not Bohr's model. The quantum mechanical model is based on what we've seen previously in regard to light and waves. De Broglie said that electrons have properties of both waves and light. You can calculate their energy very similarly. And he said that electrons are in orbitals. Not orbits, but orbitals. Now this is a very tricky concept. An orbital is a region around the nucleus where there is a 90% chance that the electron will be located. Orbitals come in different, in different shapes. So an orbital is a region around the nucleus where there is a 90% chance that the electron will be located. You can calculate the energy of an electron using this formula here. I'm not going to ask you to calculate the energy of an electron. But the electron's energy is based on its location in an orbital. We're going to get into quantum numbers here. This is going to take about 10 minutes to develop, but at the end you'll be able to answer any question that is asked of you in regard to quantum numbers. It's a little tricky. I'm going to try and explain it very simply. Each electron is assigned a unique set of four quantum numbers. And let me give you an example here so you get a feel for how this works.
let's say I'm going to a ball game and here's my ticket and my ticket has a lot of information on it. First thing I'm looking for is the level that I'm sitting in. And this one's going to say FB. Your level can be field box, the really good seats, mezzanine, and upper deck. So my ticket says FB for field box. I now know which level I'm sitting on. Field box, I shouldn't need any stairs or an elevator, etc. The next thing I'm going to look at is my section. Now, if, for example, you were at the old Yankee Stadium, Here would be your first base side and your right field side. Well, this would be more first base and then right field continuing out. This would be an odd numbered seat. And if you had more on the third base side and the left field side, that would be an even numbered seat. So let's say I've got five. Now I know what side of the stadium I'm sitting on. I have a better shot of finding my seat. The next thing is going to be my row. Let's say I've got row D. And then finally my seat number. And let's say I have three. With all of this information, I can find my seat. And some of these stadiums hold 60,000 people, which is a lot. Let's say, for example, that it was essential that we found one of you at school. We would have to know that you were in this school. We would want to know what period we were in. We would need to know what the classroom number was, and then finally I'd have to know what seat you were sitting in. If I only knew a seat and not the classroom, we wouldn't find you. If I knew the period, the classroom, and the seat, but not the school, we wouldn't find you. So in regard to an electron's location, it will have four quantum numbers. And that set of quantum numbers will be a unique set. Those four quantum numbers include N. That N is similar to those rings you saw previously. L, that's the shape of the orbital. They come in four different shapes. M sub L, the way the orbital is oriented around the axis and m sub s is the spin of the electron. So the same way we can have four pieces of information to find you in our school, we can locate an electron to 90% probability based on four quantum numbers that we're going to discuss now. Questions so far? There are four quantum numbers. Let's discuss these four quantum numbers to get a feel for the most likely location of an electron. The first quantum number is N. N is the principal quantum number, also known as the energy level or the shell. And this is very similar to what Bohr described. The larger the number, 
the higher the energy level, the farther from the nucleus. N can be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7. The higher the number, the farther from the nucleus. What's very interesting is that when you learn how to write electron configurations tomorrow, you're going to come up with something like this. This is going to look like Chinese. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. That's an electron configuration. And you're going to learn how to write them tomorrow. It looks very hard, and I promise it's extremely easy. All kids are good at writing electron configurations. I promise. The number before the letter is the N. So N equals 1. For both of these, N equals 2. N equals 3. What's the highest value of N here? 3. The element that corresponds with this electron configuration, happens to be sodium, is in the third row of the periodic table. N is the number before the letter. N is the shell, also known as the energy level or principal quantum number. N is the first of four quantum numbers to identify an electron. The second quantum number we want to mention is L. And L is the shape of the orbital. It comes in four different shapes. We'll take a look at it. L is also known as the sublevel and more commonly as the subshell. We have four different shapes. I'll show you what they look like, but you don't have to memorize it. The four shapes are represented by the letters S, lowercase, P, D, and F, and they have L values of 0, 1, 2, and 3. Those shapes look as follows, and they're a little funky. S is a sphere. 1s, 2s, 3s. What's the difference between 1, 2, and 3s? The size, right? But they all are spherical. So the larger the n, the larger the shape the farther the electron is likely to be located from the nucleus. P looks like an 8. There are three different P orbitals, but the shape P looks like a figure 8. It can be oriented around the X, the Y, or the Z axis. D for diffuse looks like a double figure eight but a little bit pinched. Looks almost like a little flower or a four leaf clover maybe. So you've got one, two, three, four, five of these Ds in the sense that they can be oriented around the axes five different ways. So this is an orbital also with a D shape. And then finally, we have F. Now there's one of the S and three of the P and five of the D. And what would you guess you'd have of the F? Seven. So that's F. You don't need to know what they look like. You don't have to recognize them. L 
is the shape of the orbital. Now shells contain subshells. So within those rings, if you will, you have subshells. The first principal energy level or shell where N is 1 has one subshell, and that's 1S. And some of this won't come together till tomorrow. The second principal energy level or shell has two subshells, 2S and 2P. What's the N for both of these? 2 is correct. The third principal energy level or shell where N is 3, how many subshells you think it has? We had 1, we had 2, and now we have 3, 3S, 3P, and 3D. The fourth principal energy level or shell has how many subshells? 4. 4, and that's the most you can have. So the fifth level, the sixth, and the seventh all have 4 subshells. Let's go back to our electron configuration that looked so funny and let me show you that you can answer a few questions about it already. For this subshell, what's the N? If you have S, what is the L equal to for S? How about zero? zero. All right, let's look here. For 2S, what's N? What's L? Zero. For 2P, what's N? What's L? For 3S, what's N? What's L? So none of these have the exact same N and L both. What might you guess that these numbers represent? How many are on the line? How many are on the in the area. And what when you mean how many, how many what? Electrons. You got it. And that's going to indicate how many electrons. We'll get into that tomorrow. The lessons really go together. Okay. This next part's going to bother you. It's really easy. One thing that I mentioned to you is that not for S, because there's only one way to orient it around the axis. It just plops right on. But for P, you've got one, two, three different ways P orbitals can be oriented around the axis, five different ways for D, and seven for F. Let's see how that's determined. So M sub L is the third quantum number of four, and this is the orientation of the orbital about the axis. So the orientation of the orbital about the axis. You can figure out how many m sub l values you have by doing 2l plus 1. That tells you how many orbitals of that shape exist. The actual m sub l values are negative l through positive l and that's very tricky. Let's walk through this and then we can fill in the blanks. For example, if you have, let's say, a 3s, what is L equal to? What numeric value? Zero. The number of M sub L values is equal to 2L plus 1. So 2 times 0 plus 1 is 1. So there's one 
possible m sub l value. The value for m sub l is the negative l through the positive l. So the value here is zero. Let's say that you had 4p. What's l equal to? So the number of possible m sub l values is 2l plus 1. So 2 times 1 plus 1 is? 3. And the m sub l values are the negative through the positive, and you need three of them. Negative one, zero, and positive one. This piece? Yeah. Do you understand how many? Yeah. So you need three, one, two, three. It's the negative of this through the positive, and you'll always have zero in the middle. So Gavin, for example, if you had a 5D, what's L equal to? Two. Two is correct. The number of possible M sub L values would be 2L plus 1, which is? Five. Five is correct. Two times two plus one. And Gavin, the M sub L values here would be what? What else? One and three. You got it. Got it now? Yeah. Yes, yes? Okay. So in looking at this, when you're considering how many orbitals you have of that shape, that's the 2L plus 1. So we establish that this is 1, that this is 3, that this is 5, and that this would be seven, and those values are here. And for example, with F, it's always the negative L, so negative three, to the positive L, so positive three, and everything in between. And some of this will click when we do the electron configs. I'll ask you a series of questions at the end and I'll show to you that you can answer all of them. I know you don't believe me, but I promise. The last quantum number is the spin. We'll go through spin more next time when we draw everything, but M sub S is the spin of the electron. Electrons will either spin counterclockwise or clockwise. And the way we represent this is if this circle represents an orbital, a region in space where there's a 90% chance that the electron will be located, the electron is either in the arrow up position or the arrow down.